And welcome back. We are in the home stretch, two full days of Zoom meetings. Kudos to everybody. I want to remind everyone that live captioning is available uh, using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This session will be recorded for future viewing, and we will be sending out information shortly after the symposium uh, regarding, uh, regarding the videos. We ask the audience to please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. And we remind you that we will unfortunately not have time to answer all questions, but we'll do our very best to get to as many as possible. Also, in the interest of time, we've decided to forego our full introductions. If you want to find out more information about our panelists or moderator, please visit our website or use your program. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Kelly Fisher, a graduate student in Museum Studies, for her assistance with this session. Our next session is titled Progressive Deaccession moderated by Sarah Douglas. Sarah has been an art journalist and editor for numerous publications for 20 years and was appointed editor-in-chief of Art News in July 2014. Welcome and thank you, Sarah. Hello. Um, so I think it's Obviously, it's very appropriate that this panel is coming uh, just after Christopher Bedford's talk. Um, what he was talking about, the association of deaccessioning with some of the urgent issues that have come up, uh, especially over the past year with the pandemic and Black Lives Matter and attention to salary inequities in museums. Um, is uh, what uh, Glenn Adamson, who was on our panel, um, was very much pointing to, um, as well as the deaccessioning and using those funds to buy works by underrepresented artists in his essay that he wrote for Apollo Magazine last fall called Progressive Deaccessioning. So I really would like to just get to it because we have a lot to talk about. And I'd really like to start with you, uh, Glenn. And um, for those of you who haven't read uh, the article and even those of you have, who have, um, I'd love to hear you talk a bit about the essay, um, Glenn, how you came to this particular phrase, progressive deaccessioning. And I'll just read the, the sort of key sentence um, in your essay, which first refers to this. Um, in a strategy that might be called progressive deaccessioning, several museums in North America have begun selling off high value art and putting the realized funds towards works by underrepresented artists. So tell us a little bit about progressive deaccessioning and then I'd like to hear about the arguments against it and how you would argue against those arguments. And um, we, we had discussed this at, at one point earlier. I hoped you could use the examples of the Everson and then perhaps something like Delaware to look at two very different examples of deaccessioning to get closer to what we're talking about today. Sure. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's great to be here. And I think, um, as you said, really Oh, you know what? I totally omitted to do our introductions. I'm so sorry, everyone. I just wanted to get straight to it. I, I will go back and do that now. Um, Glenn, as I, we've already almost gotten into it, is an independent curator and writer in New York, the author of at the aforementioned article on progressive deaccessioning in Apollo. Julia Pelta Feldman is postdoctoral research fellow in the preservation of performance at Bern University of the Arts. She's written about deaccessioning as a form of reparative justice for American, German, and Swiss publications. Stephanie Johnson Cunningham, who we heard her amazing talk the other night to start all of this off, her advocacy aligns with Museum Hue, an organization she co-founded and where she serves as creative director, supporting Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And finally, Michelle 
Miller Fisher, who hails from Scotland, is an educator, curator, and historian <clears throat> in universities and museums, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, and the MFA Boston, where she currently works. And now that I've actually done that, Glenn, I'm handing it over to you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. It's still great to be here. And uh, it's really appropriate to be following from Christopher Bedford's uh, keynote. And, and indeed, I think we could consider our panel to some extent to be an extension and consideration of what he had to say there. And certainly the Baltimore Museum was very much the example that I had foremost in my mind when writing that essay for uh, Apollo, which came out in October, which in a funny way seems like a long time ago in the way of the past year, perhaps. But um, I would align myself to something that Christopher said in his keynote there, which was that his efforts to acquire only work by women for a year or to go out big in this deaccessioning campaign was at least in part a publicity strategy, a chance to change the conversation. And I think here we need to recognize the fact that museums need to not look after only their own internal affairs, but consider their unusual position as platforms and voices within the larger culture. And because museums could be construed to have more uh, compass of movement, more you know, room to maneuver essentially, than other institutions. I think it's important to bear that in mind. Maybe that's a point that we can return to. But for my purposes, I just wanna say that my main objective in writing the essay was just to put the phrase progressive deaccessioning out in the air because I'm very attuned, I suppose, as a writer to the power of language. And I think it's one of those situations where how it gets labeled will very much determine what the fate of the strategy itself is. And I am extremely in favor of it, as will probably be clear from a reading of the article. And it seemed to me that framing it explicitly as a progressive political instrument was extremely important at this stage. So to be honest, those two words were my main goal. And for that reason, I'm delighted that we're having a panel that's actually called progressive deaccessioning. So apparently in some ways, um, at least that objective was fulfilled. You had also asked me to talk a little bit about the arguments against progressive deaccessioning. Um, and I'll just maybe isolate two of them. One is that um, there, is, uh, there is no way to turn the tide on the burden of history and that museums shouldn't set themselves up to fail. So the objective of actually balancing out your collection at this point is just so far from any conceivable reality, given the numbers that Christopher read, you know, 90% plus white men in the collection of the BMA, similar figures for every museum. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. So shouldn't we be setting ourselves under targets when we think about equity? And in response to that, as I wrote, I think the answer has to be the only way to begin is to begin because it just doesn't seem to me ethically salvageable to proceed on the basis that we're just going to accept that for the rest of our lives and the lives of our children and our grandchildren. We have to take radical action to change those statistics and there's just no way around it. And so those critics who have said um, that this will never be adequate or that we should be concentrating our efforts elsewhere, I think are, are sorely mistaken, frankly. Um, the other uh, argument that I'll address is that there should be other sources of money that are placed to the purpose of doing this rebalancing. And I think, as I said in the article, you know, having been a museum director myself uh, for a couple of years, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, um, I think that only sounds persuasive if you've never worked in a museum. And certainly if you've never worked in a museum uh, development department or as a director, if you have, you know that the horse trading and political intrigue and sheer difficulty of getting money in the door almost on any premise is sufficient that it exposes you to the most complex and um, intractable of political and hierarchical structures that we have in this country. And so looking to the fundraising function of museums as the principal means by which we um, essentially engage in this reparation work is exactly the wrong direction. It's the least likely, um, it's the least likely thing to work. And because museums have uh, very few other options in terms of deep-pocketed resources than their own collections, it seems to me almost 
axiomatic that it has to be the way forward. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about that, um, but I think those are the two key points to make. And finally, just to say um, a little bit about the difference between, let's say, the Everson and Delaware, which might help to frame the conversation and the terminology a little bit. I think it's important not to misconstrue the phrase de progressive deaccessioning to apply to conditions like that that was being faced by Delaware, which, as I understand it, was really just budget shortfalls that were being met by the deaccessioning of an important work um, without any particular intention to rebalance the ethical uh, matrix of the collection. That to me is not progressive. And you can argue the pros and cons of it as a sort of museum stewardship issue, but it seems to me a wholly separate issue. What the Everson Museum was doing and selling its Pollock last year, however, was very explicitly framed as a progressive effort to change the nature of its collection, reach its audience in a totally different way, very parallel to what was being described by Christopher in his efforts and that of his team at the Baltimore Museum. And so that's what I think of as progressive. It has to be conscious, intentional, and targeted. And just the very last thing I'll say in line with that is that I believe very firmly that we should trust curators and directors and everyone else at the museum to make deaccessioning decisions just as much as we trust them to make collecting decisions. And it seems to be remarkable and telling that curators are subjected to um, scrutiny um, at a, a level uh, when they deaccession that they are not when they do accession, which to me betrays essentially a continuing hoarding mentality um, in museums. The premise here being that it's simply better thing for things to be inside museums than out of them, which seems to me to be a completely intellectually bankrupt place to begin thinking about museums. So I would like also to think about deaccessioning as simply a mirroring of collecting and think about both as having equal rigor and equal dynamism in defining the museum's trajectory. I want to ask you a couple of things quickly before we move on, Glenn. One is, um, and we did not talk about this earlier, but I became curious about it um, afterwards. Um, what kinds of reactions did you get to the essay? You know, I, at one of the panels today, I mean, you could um, tell, you know, Anne Pasternak made an allusion to, you know, how, how she has been um, treated, you know, online and, you know, various social media. Um, and uh, I don't think you got attacked on Twitter, but I mean, aside from that, what were the reactions you got from, from just people you know? Very supportive, and that might be because they are people I know. <laughs> so, you know, one, one never knows how one's being taken um, by one's uh, ideological opponents. I did get a couple of people saying very nicely that I hadn't talked them into it, but it, it was worth reading the article to see the argument in favor of progressive deaccessioning framed clearly, which of course was my intention. And I certainly don't expect that everyone should look at this exactly the way that I do. Um, but yeah, very positive on whole. And then I, I have to ask one, one more thing um, about a, a sentence in the piece that really caught my eye as sort of pushing even further into this conversation. You know, you kind of said, you said to some degree, rethinking museums for the future you know, quote unquote, decolonizing them as the current phrase has it, probably does entail dismantling, a word we heard Christopher Bedford use, the legacy not only of specific acquisitions, but of acquisitiveness itself. I mean, when, when I read that sentence, I was thinking, of course, of things like repatriation mm -hmm. um, and so forth. I just wondered what, you know, what was on what you were you're sort of trying to convey there. Yeah, so partly it is the repatriation idea in the, in the context of decolonization. Um, and it, again, this what I'm describing now is a hoarding mentality. So this presumption that a museum's value to its community is basically driven by the quantity of how much stuff it has in its control, whether it's on view or not, by the way, because of course most of it is not. Um, and this idea that a museum almost builds its credibility on the basis of like an iceberg, like what's under the waterline and the intellectual property rights that it exerts over that material, whether it's to do with online um, or scholarly circulation, whatever the context is. And I'm deeply suspicious about that as a way of deciding what makes a museum important or worthwhile. 
I think that museums need to be, and I'm obviously not alone in this, I think museums need to be basing their claims to validity on actual engagement with diverse communities. And it seems to me that that iceberg understanding of what makes a museum great is um, only really pertinent to a very small section of the population, who, by the way, of course, are tending, going to tend to be white and wealthy, at least in this country. And um, also that it connects to a kind of reactionary politics, not only of colonization, but also of wealth concentration and asymmetrical power relations that, again, being, at least according to my own terms, a political progressive, I would want to dismantle is the right word. And I think the funny thing is that I think most people in museums pretty much align to that politics, but they feel inhibited from applying those same principles in their professional lives by regulations that they had nothing to do with setting by professional bodies like AMD. And in the largest sense of implication of the article, what I wanted to encourage was precisely the kind of conversation that we're having at this conference, but then hopefully a way of moving forward thoughtfully to actually put those politics in place as action, which involves exactly you know, reversing this unthinking acquisitiveness that have defined museums for you know, 200 years. Well, and I think um, what you were just saying, I couldn't help but think that um, Charles Venable's unfortunate phrasing kind of um, dropped the veil on, on that. Um, yeah. And uh, so I wanted to uh, move to you, Stephanie. Um, I, I was hoping you could frame for us the question, the, the issues around deaccessioning you know, in terms of what has happened over the past year, particularly with regard to civil unrest, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, we just heard Christopher Bedford talk about the imperative, um, what he sees as the imperative, you know, for museums to use methods that, and I think I have his, his phrasing correct here, that are compensatory and, and reparatory mm -hmm. and the need to dismantle the existing system. And, you know, I think he's, he's thinking about besides diversifying collections, what other ways can we find to use the funds that come from deaccessioning? And of course that's been um, quite controversial, but I also wanted to bring up this point, you know, kind of because of the work you're doing with um, the particular kind of work you're doing with Museum Hue, I, I just have to mention, and I put this in my notes that I sent to you guys, I, I really, that there was this thing that Carrie Mae Weems said yesterday on her panel. She said, you know, we all need to look at the fact that diversity is being tied to the notion of deaccessioning, that diversity is tied to the notion of a negative rather than a positive. And that really struck me. Of course, that goes to what Glenn is saying about this question of, oh, you know, why do you have to deaccession? Just go to Go to your donors and you know get them to give you more money. I mean, not that that's what Carrie Mae Weems is saying. I think she's just saying it's kind of sad, mm -hmm. you know, that something that should be great is being tied to the loss of something. So I want to hand it over to you, Stephanie. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, to that point, uh, much of this boils down to when we're thinking about deaccessioning, um, it boils down to value. But we know that value is not intrinsic. Value is placed on much of this, these artworks and objects. And these works are given a higher value when they are collected, exhibited, cataloged, and publications, and other factors. But a great majority, as Glenn had also mentioned, a great majority of these works in museum collections are also in storage. So how does that make museums important or relevant um, to um, you know, the mission that uh, museums are trying to accomplish uh, today? Um, but I think too, when we think about deaccessioning as it relates to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it can sometimes be problematic because 
people are often thinking about it in the negative, um, as you were mentioned for Carrie Mae Weems, thinking about the fact that, um, you know, in order to become more equitable, we have to get rid of half of half of the collections instead of thinking, you know, do these works fit the mission and how the museum wants to go forward? Um, you know, do these works, you know, they're, they're you know, are they overrepresented um, in the collection? Um, are they saturated uh, in the field? And so thinking of, of all of those things, I think is incredibly important, but I also want to think about, you know, Christopher Bedford and, and the work that he's doing as it relates to deaccessioning and thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Having deaccessioned works, uh, uh, the, the sales use, to then purchase um, additional works by uh, black and, and, and people of color, but and, and women and you know underrepresented um, artists. But I also think about some of the other things that he was he's trying to accomplish as well. Like he's thinking about using the funds for salary, the security guards who are also again mostly black and brown um, people, thinking about how he can raise their salary from like $13 to $20. And all of that is important as well as we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's important to see the value of black art um, increase. Um, and other uh, underrepresented groups works increase, but we have to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a much broader way and in a, in a way that can really affect um, the institution as a whole, not just the institution's um, collection. And in my uh, talk on Wednesday, I, I said, I, I talked a bit about, you know, Sarah Lewis, you know, an art historian, I'm at Harvard, and she says that, you know, visual imagery is a change agent for narratives of Black life that can affect our perceptions of justice, reshaping our understanding of society. But what happens when African American art gets into a collection, but because there isn't a real focus on uh, the scholarship and, and understanding of the work, Oftentimes the work be, is under theorized and this, this can create an asymmetry between a claim and the discourse on their work. This has all sorts of consequences for their market value and their place within history. So again, the ongoing acquisition of these works does not solve the racial inequity issue. We must change our attention to inclusive narratives in the discipline of art and art history at large and a larger extension throughout the museum field. Um, as someone who created Museum Hue five years ago, there is still a large issue where, you know, uh, Black and people of color entering the museum field are still experiencing racism, microaggression, and macroaggressions that cause them to leave the field. Um, there is a high turnover rate of Black and, and people of color in the field for that very reason. People are not feeling like the, the field is equitable. And I think, again, you know, having works within your collection, within your exhibitions, does not solve a larger historical um, issue. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, equity and thinking about, you know, culturally specific museums that have been there for many years in the field, 50 odd and, and more years, uh, creating space, creating um, opportunities, creating um, mentorship and, and um, nurturing artists through artist residencies and support, displaying, showcasing their work at those institutions. But as their works and notoriety increases, predominantly white institutions are interested in their work, interested in the artists and not thinking about equitable partnerships um, with uh, Black and, and people of color's institution as well. So it's a much more rounded issue. And for me, um, you know, seeing all these conversations about, you know, the purchasing of art as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, you know, people then coming at, at 
you know, Christopher Bedford not saying, well, let's look at other ways or, or more wraparound ways to, to look at the, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion, like increasing uh, security guards, um, salary and such, but no, instead his own colleagues who are, who also uh, are white, you know, privileged and hold a lot of power comes to say, you know, the, what you're doing is, you know, a betrayal to the museum field. I mean, only someone of great privilege can even, you know, decide to, 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 to make that kind of statement, that you can decide that what this institution is doing is an entire betrayal to, to the entire field of, of museum work. I mean, to me, that is, um, that is offensive in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that the work that he's doing, I think in the future, it, it's gonna be um, applauded. I want to um, really pick up on something you said, Stephanie, um, and also to try to put something that Christopher said in, in context for some people listening, which is he talked about putting 39.5 million of the dollars he expected to get from the deaccessioning of these three artworks towards equity and salary adjustments, anywhere from three to 48%. You mentioned, Stephanie, this does in, in, indeed include front of house, security, it's all across the spectrum. And I think that, you know, we, we salaries in museums over the past two or so years have become a, 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 a major issue and, and one that we talk about in connection with what is called the pipeline problem, you know? Um, and Michelle, I, I warned you that I would do this. So, um, and we actually did something recently in, in Art News Magazine about this, um, about art and museum transparency, a group that you were involved in founding a couple of years ago. And for those of you who don't know, a spreadsheet kind of went out into the world um, that had a lot of museum salaries on it, curators salaries, I think predominantly. Um, it was across the board. Okay, well, you can correct me when I, when I hand over the mic. And I wanna ask you about the reaction to that and some of the issues that it raised, especially in, in relation to the pipeline problem and the typical thing of, you, you know, how, do you, how are you going to work for these salaries if you don't have a trust fund kind of thing? Totally, I'd be really happy to respond to that. So um, the reactions that it raised really depend on how much you earn in the museum field. So you, you can see on the salary spread and action is a little unstable. Tell me if you're having difficulty hearing me. Um, but on the salary transparency spreadsheet, you can see um, not only about 3,500 different salaries across roles and across museums internationally, but on tab two, you can see what museum directors take home. And anyone can see that because you can look up the 990 of a US um, museum institution and see what that is. Um, and so uh, the reactions in the mainstream were really folks saying, I'm not getting paid or compensated enough to uh, live in the geographic region that I live in where I, where I work. Um, I'm not getting compensated enough to pay off student debt, yet I'm expected to have at least a master's and often more than one graduate degree in order to be competitive for this role, not even to have applied and to have secured it. And so the really vast inequity between people at the lowest rung of the ladder, I mean, Christopher Bedford is talking about raising security officers salaries from $13 an hour to $20 an hour, raising them to a $40,000 a year wage, which in many places is still not a living wage, it's certainly not a princely sum. And so yeah, the, 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 the reactions were um, not really surprised because I think most people in our field know how underpaid and how inequitable um, museum salaries are. We followed up with a spreadsheet on um, unpaid internships and then uh, the solution to the organization spreadsheet. Um, but I, I've, I feel very strongly about several of the things that Stephanie and Glenn have raised. Um, security offices and BSAs are direct care. Museums don't open without them. And so if we're thinking about what direct care is and how we, we museums function, they are absolutely a part of that. So equitable wages go towards helping keep the museum open, which is part of the, uh, the mission. 
And I also want to respond to your thought about what Karen May Reem said, which is a really beautiful thought. I wasn't um, present at the panel, so I don't have the entire context for it. But the root of what we're talking about here is giving things up um, and not just objects, but really actually power. And I think that that can be celebratory. I don't think it has to be a loss. I don't think it has to be something that has to be grieved. I think it can be something incredibly celebratory. And so that I think is where we should be moving from, that it's not that we're giving something up and it's a terrible thing to do that. But giving up is something that is talked a lot about today in terms of very bluntly, white people, white wealthy people giving things up because that is part of reparation. And if we can't embrace that and put our hands around it, then we're not fit to lead the missions of most museums into actuality. I want to bring up in connection with this and in connection with something that Glenn was talking about, um, you know, this idea that, okay, you know, if we, if we jump off the ledge as museums, if we jump off the ledge and we, we do progressive deaccessioning, we go even further, we're going to lose our donors, we're going to lose our donor base. Um, and something that you had mentioned in an earlier conversation we had is that there are donors waiting in the wings to come in precisely because museums would, you know, would do these kinds of things, would take the risk of doing these kinds of things. So there's that on the one hand. On the other hand, do we have to accept that some of our institutions perhaps won't make it? And, and that's, you know, how history shakes out, but we've got to move forward. Can you, can you address those things a little bit? Sure, Sarah, yeah, and I, I mean, I have so many thoughts about this question. It's a really good one. <laughs> so actually, I'm gonna try and keep mine as succinct as possible because I think this point really de deserves robust discussion. And it's something that Glenn talked about in um, his fantastic article. It's something that, has, that many people have thought about before what I'm going to say here. So I guess I'm raising some of the obvious responses so that we can pick them apart in discussion. I do think it's important to remember that museums are not monolithic. So we are having this conversation because we should be nuanced and incredibly specific Specific about context every single time. Museum donors are not monolithic and so we can't you know make assumptions or generalizations or stereotypes about any of these things. Um, the panel directly after ours has def different museum directors on it and they have wildly different operating budgets and they work in wildly different contexts. So I'm so glad for a symposium like this and these types of discussions because as Christopher said um, we, we need to have nuance. We need to be able to be unafraid of having all of the discussions the accessioning being one of them when we start to think about what equity means in our institutions. Um, in terms of donors waiting in the wings, I, I mean, again, I have, I have so many thoughts about this part too. Um, the accessioning happens in museums all the time. So it's not something that is new um, and uh, there are donors who, who know about it very well and are not put off by it. Um, museums are not monolithic, and I'm using air quotes, so they don't make these decisions. People who govern museums make, make these decisions, and so board members, directors who report to those board members are making those decisions. So right now, I think actually rather than thinking that there's donors waiting in the wings to come in, um, or that there are donors who would be um, very happy to support an institution that moved radically towards embracing deaccessioning because it could then um, uh, uh, shake out into uh, 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 embracing the, the mission for equity in a museum um, or in an institution. I think it's about asking how uh, donors and boards and governance works in the first place and being able to think about new models for that. Um, and not even new models actually, looking to museums, because of course, again, they come in all different sizes, who do this successfully from the get-go. Several, many museums, not several, many museums have been founded in opposition to the larger Met Museums or MoMAs of the world, precisely because their forms of governance, their forms of representation in their collection, their forms of staffing um, were anathema. Um, I often think of one of the most sort of prime examples of that being the Studio Museum in Harlem. And so I think being able to think about different ways of governance and the way that um, donors come to museums in the first place and the way that they have um, agency, this very small, very white, very wealthy group of people have agency over the types of decisions we make in all forms of um, museum governance, not just in terms of deaccessioning, is incredibly important. The last thing I want to say in terms of um, donors waiting in the wings, although it's, 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 it's more tangential, 
Christopher's name comes up a lot, not only because his panel preceded ours, but because it's become synonymous in, in the papers with what happened at, at Baltimore. Um, and I want to remind people that two really amazing female curators made the, um, the, the recommendation for this to go ahead. So if you erase their scholarship and you erase what they have done in terms of um, a, a really well argued and incredibly well reasoned um, defense of deaccessioning these three works, then um, yeah, I, I, I find it really difficult not to, to talk about that particular part of it. So if, if donors are offended by that, then, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot to say to them. And I, I really feel like um, the, yeah, I, I feel like there are other donors waiting to be able to, um, to support museums who are willing to support well-reasoned deaccessioning policy and uh, uh, missions that move us towards better equity in our institutions. Um, Julia, I wanted to um, direct a question to you about your thinking about deaccessioning. Um, and, you know, as you pointed out when we spoke earlier, you are, you know, very much, um, I think you characterize yourself as, uh, well, it's easy for her to say um, on that side of things. Um, nevertheless, you you spoke about um, really putting deaccessioning, um, thinking of it as a form of, of restitution, which we heard, we heard allusions to that in, in Christopher Bedford's talk as well. Um, and you talked about a, a very interesting exhibition that you saw in Berlin and how it made you start thinking about that. And I hope that you could talk about that a little bit. Sure, thanks. Um, so I began to think about the potential for deaccessioning to serve as a form of, of restitution in, uh, in 2018, when I was uh, living in Berlin um, and following the debates there about um, post-colonialism in the art world. And uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof at that time had a massive museum-wide exhibition or, or really a group of exhibitions called Hello World, Revising a Collection, um, which was a clear attempt to present multiple modernisms to show the work of modern artists from many parts of the world that are not usually represented in their galleries um, as their collection is, is heavily focused on art from Western Europe and the US. And, and to be clear, there were many wonderful aspects of, of those exhibitions. Uh, but I thought it was quite strange that it was deliberately titled Revising a Collection uh, when all of the non-Western works were actually temporary loans. Uh, in other words, rather than committing to change, uh, they wanted to, as I saw it, um, kind of get their decolonization over with, uh, with one big exhibition, um, meaning that the Hamburger Bahnhof actually admitted that they had made a mistake in neglecting these works and these artists, but that they weren't going to make a permanent change in their collection. Uh, and while um, I don't believe that a museum's collection alone uh, defines its identity, I do think that its collection should reflect that identity. And, and I believe collections often do show a museum's true values, uh, whether those are stated in its, in its mission statement or not. Uh, so if a museum isn't willing to change its collection, then any claim to pursuing diversity and justice seems hollow to me. Um, and, and in Europe, the restitution of artworks and artifacts stolen under colonialism is currently a huge topic, but there's less discussion about how to decolonize modernism. Uh, and meanwhile, in North America, uh, as, as all of this was happening in, in Berlin, um, I was noticing the Baltimore Museum, um, as well as SF MoMA and the, the Art Gallery of Ontario coming up a lot in the news for deaccessioning major works in order to diversify their collections. Uh, and in some cases to buy uh, work by important artists, often non-white artists or, or women artists, um, whose work had, they had previously failed to acquire. Uh, and it struck me that we can see this too as a form of restitution. It's a restitution of significance restoring those previously marginalized works and figures to their rightful place in the history and the canon of modern art. And it's actually something that um, I think uh, Christopher Bedford alluded to as well in his talk about a, a show in, in the Baltimore Museum's history of African-American art where nothing was acquired. And it's a real problem that if you fail for whatever reason to acquire a work by someone like Harry May Weems back then, that work's going to get more and more and more expensive until it's almost like you've missed your chance. You know, you, you don't have 
you know, museums have such limited acquisition budgets as we know. And, and so deaccessioning can be a way to... I'm going to just jump in for one second here and say um, that Bob Nickus wrote a great article for Art News about the history of MoMA in relation to Jean-Michel Basquiat, mm -hmm. and it's exactly what you're talking about. They they waited too long, they couldn't get one, and there you're talking about $100 million. So. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, that's a fantastic example. Um, and uh, I'd also, one more point that I'd like to make on that, um, because of course, what, what I'm talking about here is uh, primarily this issue uh, still of, of the kind of more traditional use of deaccessioning funds to buy more art. But I think that um, connecting restitution to progressive deaccessioning helps us to make sense of the idea that a museum would give up something of value, something important, rather than the redundancies and the works of lesser value that are, are often considered kind of fair game for deaccessioning. Because restitution is only meaningful when it involves giving up something important. That's what it's about. That's how a museum demonstrates its commitment to justice. Temporary exhibitions are enough. Uh, lip service isn't enough. And so when you're, when you're giving up something that is valuable, like a Rothko, uh, like a Franz Klein, you're, you're showing um, that you actually are committed to this. Um, so I think in that sense, restitution also helps us see the positive side of deaccessioning. You are giving something up. And I think, um, you know, as, as several of, of my colleagues have already mentioned, you know, I think we have to accept the fact that you're giving something up, but you're giving something up in pursuit of a new kind of wholeness that ultimately is something very positive. I want to come back um, to Michelle, you mentioned the Studio Museum. And Stephanie, I wanted to ask you, you know, from the work that you've done, um, and, and we, we've done articles about this recently in the magazine as well, about these culturally specific museums um, and, and what the larger, larger museums can learn from what they have been doing. And I think we've seen a lot of that recently, but I, I hope that you could talk about that in a little bit more detail. Can I yeah. Just, yeah. Go, Stephanie, go. Can I can I ask you, Stephanie? I'd be really just adding on to what Sarah just said. Then I feel like some of these larger museums are culturally specific as well in that they are relevant in terms of what they show and how they show it. So that question for me, I wanted to nuance slightly. But Stephanie, I, I see you. Yes, um, totally, Michelle, and and I I, I get your point. Um, but in this definition of culturally specific museums, um, first, you know, thinking about uh, those specifically created within Black um, and other people of color's communities specifically. So these institutions are also sometimes referred to as community museums. So these institutions, again, um, in the field, heavily under theorized. Um, their community centered approach um, over collection centered within the museum practice. Um, and so their work specifically looks at how museums um, can be uh, in the service of the community. So putting community care at the central theme and also their focus, whether it be in their collections, their exhibitions, the services that they provide, there's a specificity to them. They're not trying to be um, everything to everyone, but specific to the community in which they not serve, but in the community that they represent. And so these institutions largely, um, you know, again, created uh, 50 odd years ago were really essential in creating a platform that was lost or missing within larger predominantly white institutions. And so these uh, museums were kind of the birthplace for, like you mentioned, Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, creating opportunities for both black artists and black curators, the ones that are honestly the most celebrated in the field really comes out of the school and scholarship and training from these culturally specific museums. But to your point, <laughs> Michelle, about these institutions in a lot of ways, the larger institutions being um, culturally specific in a sense as well, but 
uh, to the world saying that they're an institution about everyone for everyone, right? But these institutions, you know, are very different in the sense too that they were uh, not created, uh, you know, like in the 19th and early uh, 20th century. A lot of them were created uh, within like the 21st century. So a lot of them are newer, younger, much smaller institutions that don't have the um, acclaim. Uh, per se, like the larger um, institutions, a lot of which we're discussing today. But I think largely what these institutions can um, showcase to large art and encyclopedic institutions is that a museum can be successful in not just thinking about um, or leaning on their collections, right? Because these institutions don't, don't have you know, they have collections, they're much smaller, they don't have thousands upon thousands of ends of, of artwork and objects where only 10% are on view like most large institutions. And these institutions, again, they do really well in telling authentic stories and showcasing authentic arts and culture. And so I think that those institutions can really provide the future of museums, moving away from museums being about, you know, particular people, about particular broader, um, um, I should say, you know, kind of this, this broader narrative around, you know, art, this art world um, that is, um, for and about everyone and everything to looking very specifically at how these institutions can become more relevant to our everyday experiences, um, whether it be, you know, tackling social justice issues and social justice looks, um, uh, looks, you know, it looks uh, like a lot of different things, but, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about how it relates to, um, you know, racial and, you um, uh, issues and also thinking about women as well. But I think that these institutions can really highlight the way that museums should move forward in thinking about how we can connect the collections with experience, with uh, relevancy more. Um, I actually wanna ask you something, Stephanie, um, because I, I, I wonder what your interpretation of this is. Um, since we just heard, you know, Christopher speak about how he made his institution made the decision that it did, um, and he spoke early on in his talk about, um, you know, it's not enough to to have this mission to put things on the walls, and he included it's not enough to have certain kinds of programming, and he talked about. Um, the, the need to sort of live your mission to provide maximum access to be grounded in and driven by certain values. So I guess what struck, struck me about that is we tend to think, well, you know, if the museum's not entirely about its collection, it's also about its programming, right? So you bring in, oh, well, the programming, we're gonna have you know, inclusive programming and, and so on and so forth. What to you is, it seems to me what he's trying to get at is a really a holistic, like the museum must stand for something. It must be, you know, it must be seeped, steeped in this understanding. It, it must be a living, you know, sort of entity that represents something. Can, can you tell me what sort of your interpretation and perhaps if we could picture a museum, you know, let's say we have the BMA, but it's not the BMA how it is now. It's the BMA that is living this holistic, um mission it's living and breathing its mission and it has you know maximum accessibility like literally what does that look like from everything from staffing to interpretation to you know the whole the whole gamut yeah i think uh, michelle also touched on this earlier too thinking about how we are thinking about things like direct care how are we expanding the ideas of diversity equity and inclusion how are we making it a part of the everyday inner workings of the institution and I think for me um, you know that looks like thinking about not just you know the collection uh, um, staff or thinking about the curatorial staff I think it also looks like um, how the you know education department and curatorial departments can better collaborate I think that 
you know, another part of the future of what I think um, some of what, you know, Chris is alluding to is thinking about how the decisions that we make in our institution, and I said this earlier, fits with whatever it is that the mission of the institution is trying to, to uh, accomplish, what it's trying to provoke, hopefully, and what it's trying to um, support in a lot of ways as well. So I think that a lot of the work that that you know, people like Christopher Bedford um, is doing and others is really looking at a holistic approach on how to support one um, in the staff. Again, whether it be the, the, uh, the salary um, uh, that we uh, alluded to or, or spoke about earlier, whether it be thinking about um, better collaboration of different departments, and then again, collaboration and partnerships with Studio Museum um, of, in, in Harlem and other institutions that are doing this critical work as well. I think that in the future, cultural authority should be better shared. I think it is being hoarded right now uh, within the museum field. And I think that there should be greater support um, and authority and power given throughout more uh, uh, spurs throughout the field than it is now. And the, the one other thing I wanted to, to say about that is in conversations like this, I, I keep thinking back to, um, and I reached out to the authors recently to, to speak with them about something related to it. Uh, and and uh, uh, an article that the Times ran, it was an op-ed and it had to do with um, the lack of art critics of color. And one of the things that was brought up, I, I'm sure everyone remembers this terrific piece, um, was something I've been thinking about a lot, which is, you know, the idea of lived is someone's lived experience and lived, you know, reality and how that relates in a way to aesthetics, right? So if you have an artwork that is made by someone who is coming from a certain lived experience, and then, you know, you, well, so who's doing the interpretation on that, right? Like who is interpreting that for audiences? Is it someone who is able to get at what's really going on in, in that artwork? You know, and I think that that really gets to the, the, to the underlying issues at museums is sort of, you can't just bring in, you know, do, do the deaccessioning, bring in work by diverse group of artists if you don't have the staff to do the interpretation and the scholarship. And I think that's, you know, I, I would love to hear about that. And, and then also, Glenn, I, I wanna circle around back to you because I'm really curious as a journalist, how do we raise these issues and talk about them without it being like, um, uh, you know, an all out war? or a sort of completely polarized and no one can, you know, people can't hear what the other person's saying because all they hear is, we won't have museums anymore. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how do we all get to a point where it's a conversation rather than um, a dispute? Yeah, I'm, I mean, that's a question you could ask about so many aspects of American life at the moment, and this is just one of them. And I think usually the answer is specificity. It's always at least the first thing to try because a great way of lowering the temperature of any debate is to get into detail because then hopefully even a very motivated intellectual combatant will realize that they might be a bit out of their depth and not really understand what's going on and at least stop long enough to listen if only to take a breath for their next moment of argumentation, you know. And that connects to something that I wanted to say about the other point you were making about art criticism and um, I suppose the availability of a work to a particular subject position might be a way of putting it. And, you know, Michelle rightly pointed out that we shouldn't just be talking about Christopher Bedford of BMA, and I'm sure he would be the first to say this. We should also be talking about, for example, Asma Naim, who is actually my informant on my article, not Christopher, and she's the chief curator at Baltimore. And she's such a great example of somebody who's doing this deaccessioning work in a way that is painstakingly attentive to the history of the museum, to the mm -hmm. existing contours of the collection, also to the audience of the museum, and trying to figure out a way to get those things to gear together more successfully. So to me, that issue of expertise 
really is the first thing to highlight when thinking about how we make this not a flame war or a clash between irreconcilable perspectives. And it sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier, you know, we instinctively trust curators to buy things and we instinctively distrust them to sell things for some reason. So there's that point. But I think if we could get over that, we understand the accessioning is a very subtle, learned methodology that re does require years of training to get right, then I think we'll have, that will be a sign that we're making progress. I think there's, um, there's maybe a, a very interesting and perhaps difficult thing there in relation to what Stephanie was just saying, because if I'm understanding you rightly, Stephanie, you're also saying that we need to be thinking about expertise and decision-making as a more broadly shared phenomenon in museums. And by highlighting someone like Asma and, and her work and thinking about her knowledge base and her professionalism, and essentially saying, I'm trusting her to make these decisions for that institution and in turn for the community. I am returning to a kind of traditional curatorial authority, I suppose. And I, and I see that that's in a state of tension with the desire to have, let's say, community-based decision-making and stewardship over the institution. That to me seems like a really interesting and important discussion to have. And I think it's one that we should welcome. Um, and can I just say one other thing, Sarah, um, which is just in response to some of the questions that are coming up in the Q&A, but I think they're very pertinent here. Um, so a couple of questioners have raised the prospect that, for example, a university art museum might be subjected essentially to a fire sale to pay, the, uh, pay off the budget pressures of the institution that is their parent just to say the university. And this is not an as innocently chosen example because of course, Christopher Bedford became the director of the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis only three years after it tried to have just such a fire sale. And I think there's a well-founded fear out there in the sector that if progressive deaccessioning does become a common phenomenon, it will be used as a pretext to do things that are by no means progressive and in fact are regressive. And I guess my answer to that would just be you know, any good idea can be misused. And if the museum sector does decide to lean into this idea of progressive deaccessioning, then it can't lose sight of the progressive part. It can't just become deaccessioning is a regular operation of the museum and it should become more and more casualized. That's not the point at all. The point is to think of it as an extremely intentional strategic instrument to engage in reparation work. So that, that absolutely needs to be part of the conversation at all times. And I think the questioners uh, points are very well taken in that regard. Can, can I briefly add something to that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to using funds from deaccessioning for something other than new acquisitions, you know, there's probably uh, a lot of, a lot of um, arts professionals who would feel that that should only be used in a type of emergency. But I think that white supremacy is an emergency. Income inequality is an emergency. These are not, um, uh, as is sometimes charged, just museums kind of trying to scrounge up money for, for whatever they feel like doing. These, these are crises that the museum world is experiencing. So I do want to turn to some of the questions now. And um, I don't want to leave out some of the more uh, challenging questions. And Kelly, who is looking at these, I'm maybe overriding you a little bit here. So I'm going to ask um, some, a question from, from someone who is, who, who is taking this on, Glenn. Um, progressive deaccessioning de is excellent branding, but the call for selling from museum collections to fund operations is actually Thatcherite. Margaret Thatcher advocated the plan in Britain in the 1980s. How did this transformation of a neocon slash neoliberal idea into a progressive rallying cry come about? Yeah, and I, I see that's a question from not just anyone, but in fact, Christopher Knight, who's a uh, well-attested opponent of this whole strategy. Um, I mean, I can only say that that's the most 
irresponsible of intellectual analogies to draw, saying that uh, progressive work, uh, reparation work of this kind has any similarity to Margaret Thatcher's ideology, you know, or the effects of her policies on the diverse community of Britain in the 1980s just suggests to me absolutely no curiosity in the real terms of this debate. Amen to that. And I grew up under Thatcher, so I have an idea of it, like exactly what Ken said. Yeah. Well, I've been uh, I've been watching Adam Curtis's documentaries recently, so learned a lot more about Thatcher than I used to know. Um, Here's some more questions that are coming through, and I'm going to go through these in the order they're being sent to me. Um, can you speak a bit to museums whose collections do not have a large monetary value? So the deaccessioning of a few works can't raise significant funds, e.g. BMA's three pieces uh, equal, well, they say 1.5 million here, but it's actually a, much more than that. Um, it might take half the collection to raise that kind of financial support. How can progressive deaccessioning play a role for these smaller institutions without losing the collection as a whole? For example, history museums who have similar representation gaps. Who wants to take on this one? I have an open thought that I would be um, interested in hearing others uh, uh, pick the tires of and make better or discard. Um, the question is asked by a colleague of mine who I respect very much, a really wonderful craft curator, Samantha. And um, I, I think when we work as curators, we often think only within our institutions, but some of the most progressive accessioning policies have happened when we have shared those accessions across institutions. We've been able to acquire something using the combined power of several different institutions. What would it look like as part of rethinking the governance of museums, especially larger museums, which is often where this conversation on deaccessioning is falling? What would it be to think about that kind of progressive deaccessioning along a sort of similar or parallel model where the funds from it are uh, redistributed in ways throughout the community and that community might also include smaller um, arts organizations within the locality of a larger institution. I think part of what we're talking about here is how to keep ecosystems healthy and how what, what museums role is in um, various overlapping intersecting communities and part of a museum's community is also its sister um, institutions. So what would it look like if you were to get a windfall of $60 million and not every penny of that stayed within your particular institutional footprint, but really was within the community, which might also include, again, as I said, other institutions. So what would that kind of joint deaccessioning policy look like in terms of being able to spread or redistribute the wealth that has been locked up in these particular institutions. So Samantha, your question is really provocative because I hadn't thought about that until you proposed it. But as folks who work in the same field, I, I love working and collaborating with uh, different curators, different museum professionals. And what, what if this was just another extension of that? I'm going to go to the next question here. Um, where does transparency fit into progressive deaccessioning? Relatedly, what sort of proposed guidelines for deaccessioning would the panel suggest to allow for collections to continue to be stewarded with a shared set of ethical guidelines, even as deaccessioning parameters are expanded in the service of progressive deaccessioning? Anyone? <laughs> Transparency. I'm happy to take it on. I'm finding it in the um, uh, the questions list here, Sarah, because it's easier for me to to read it as I'm responding. Um, maybe give me a second, and I'll look for the question on transparency as I'm I'm looking. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll just say a super too. quick thing, which is that um, in line with the uh, things we've been saying about deaccessioning being framed in a positive way and a positive light. You know, one thing that deaccessioning in this way might do is actually constitute a fantastic research and documentation opportunity for precisely the works that are being deaccessioned. And actually, auction houses do this really well now. I think they tend to get short shrift from other sector, se uh, sectors uh, within the art um, field, but they often create much more extensive uh, 
and well-researched documents about the things that they're selling than museums do that are sitting in their storage rooms. So we should remember that. But leaving that aside, the kind of contribution um, of the auction house or not, I think for sure um, transparency should be a golden rule with respect to deaccessioning. And it should be uh, regarded as an opportunity to um, you know, conduct uh, research due diligence before making the decision and then publish the results of that research and the explanation for the decision, but also what's known about the artwork, good imagery of it, so that that can always be accessed for researchers. Um, you know, maybe one last thing I'll say, which I mentioned in the article, is that it's actually pretty unusual that a researcher does require direct access to a work of art physically to, let's say, refer to it. They're really specialized and they have certain um, research interests. Then, of course, physical access can be extremely important. Conservation access can be extremely important. But I do think that, um, to be blunt, the, um, the interests of the research community are sometimes overemphasized when it comes to whether things are sitting in museums or not, for what it's worth. So to me, the deaccessioning process can actually be a contribution to knowledge, not a loss in many cases. I want to um, ask this question, and Stephanie, if you want to follow along, this actually starts by referencing something you said. But I think it's an interesting question insofar as it goes to the actual infrastructure of, of museums, as long as we're talking about this holistic idea. Much as Stephanie stated, the issue of exclusion in the art world is longstanding. Black and Chicano community art spaces are real reminders of the historical exclusion at the heart of the museum field. Does the panel have hope that the culturally specific architecture, the European museum model itself, can physically be changed into another model? As progressive as certain deaccessioning approaches may be, can we use the museum's logics, acquisition slash deaccessioning, to solve a problem the model created? Hmm. Stephanie, do you feel like uh, taking this, this one on? Um, let me think about it a little bit and, and kind of get back to you. If anyone else wants to jump in. You know, I'm going to stick my neck out here and just say I still believe in museums. Like I really, really, really believe in them. I understand that the model is broken in various ways. Um, and I totally, totally accept the force of the question. Um, but I think, as I was saying earlier, I think that understanding museums as repositories of expertise, each with their own specific storylines and not lumping them all together under the heading of a kind of colonialist enterprise that's done nothing but ill. I, I, for me personally, well, again, completely accepting the truth of the question, which I think is maybe the most important one we've had so far. Um, I think that, at least for me, um, museums are a crucial part of our critical apparatus as a modern society. And that what we should be trying to do is make them better, not give up on them. I would also second what you said, Glenn, in terms of um, this being an incredibly important question. Um, I think it should probably be actually the next symposium that is done yeah. right at the heart of it. We could have an incredible day long conversation and so should we. I think what you said earlier about being incredibly specific and what I also hold very dear, there is, there's no museum monolith. There are so many different forms of museums. They take so many different shapes. They come into being for so many different reasons. Some of them that do um, operate on a quote unquote European museum model might indeed be um, using it to subvert that model in some other um, sense. So I think that it's a, a question that deserves really granular, thoughtful and um, extended responses, but I'm so glad it's been asked. And um, I think it should be continued to be asked um, and, and continue to be 
I, I agree. And thank you both um, for jumping in on that as well. I think this question is so important in thinking about how we are moving into changing this model and, and, and knowing that museums are still incredibly important, in, you know, important meeting places designed to continue to foster dialogue and spark ideas. So I think we continue to challenge the kind of, um, uh, you know, structure that museums are currently built on, at least, you know, the mainstream, uh, large predominantly white institutions that, you know, create the kind of um, framework that we know as museums today. Um, but I think that, you know, museums can definitely, you know, shift and become more relevant and, you know, think more critically how they can tap into their soft power. And I think that's happening. I think that there is a shift um, happening throughout the field. And, and it's exciting to see even these conversations, this whole panel discussion happening and, and hearing some of the things that my colleagues have said on, on this panel is, is amazing to me um, alone because, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, when I first started the field, this wasn't an open discussion. So I think that, you know, there is significant change that is happening in the field and that museums are beginning to see how they can become much more relevant and, and, and responsive um, institutions um, in a way. And I think that, you know, to specifically, you know, to that question, um, you know, there are other models already. Um, and so are we gonna continue to look to these large institutions as the model? Um, I think a lot of institutions have already breaking, breaking away from it. Um, and I think to give greater recognition to those um, institutions, I think that academia plays a, lar a large part into it as well. And so if they can also join in the charge and thinking differently about museums um, and institutions, I think um, you know our education has a lot to do with how we approach museum work. So, um, that's totally happening. I want to put something out there in terms of Glenn, you were saying, you know, I still believe in the museum. Um, after seeing the artist panel, I wonder if we need more artists on these things. And one that I would love to see talk about this is Carrie James Marshall, who, as many of you know, who have listened to his lectures, um, of which there are many and they're all amazing. Um, or spoken with him or read about him, you know, he has said that he would go and visit the Art Institute of Chicago and he would look at how many black figures he saw on the wall and there would be like three. And he would, and he made a point of selling his own work to museums because he just thought, well, I'll get on the wall. I'll get my work on the wall and then there will be black figures on the wall, you know, mm -hmm. and what an amazing thing to set out to do that and then actually do it. You know, he, he kind of said, well, I'm gonna work in, from within the system, you know, and that's, and I think it, it kind of gets to what, what Glenn is saying is we, you know, we don't have to throw out the museums. Um, maybe it's just having a belief that is, po that it's possible to change them. And I'll just put one thing, one more thing before. Very, very quickly, very quickly, okay. Sarah. Very quickly, I just wanted to make a joke that may not land, which is that, um, Glenn, I was thinking about if I just told someone, oh, well, this panel is called progressive deaccessioning, that they'd think it's about progressively deaccessioning the entire collection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Uh, with that, I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see everybody in just a few minutes for our final session. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>